one principle has been the primary way geological data has been interpreted for about the last 200 years. Uniformitarianism and the Age of the Earth, this week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. Now our topic this week is uniformitarianism and the age of the earth. We're going to examine rock layers used to supposedly prove the, uh, the vast age of the earth and how these ideas, uh, to, which are popular today, came to be. Uniformitarianism is the concept that only processes observed today, like, like slow sedimentation, slow erosion, things like that, should be used to explain the history of the rocks. It's often summarized by the slogan, the present is the key to the past. That's uniformitarianism. And, and this concept was made popular by Charles Lyell. Uh, he lived from 1797 to 1875. And Lyell and his ideas were, were certainly some of the, the biggest influences in the life of a certain Charles Darwin. And Darwin embraced the doctrine of uniformitarianism as a, and he applied it to biology as a way to explain the diversity of life on Earth. Right, yeah. It's upon this rigidly held doctrine that the majority of geological data has been interpreted for, again, about the past 200 years. This doctrine eliminates from consideration the very possibility of the global flood recorded in the Bible. Now, it's true that in recent years, the doctrine has been modified to allow an occasional catastrophe, such as uh, the Lake Missoula flood, for example, and other things, an asteroid impact that supposedly wiped out the dinosaurs. But basically, the doctrine continues to be the foundation for mainstream geology. Right. Now, Lyle uh, shared the, the radical Unitarian belief that the world should be explained only by the action of natural laws currently operating. Yep. So he, he was a deist in his thinking. Uh, God made the universe, but then played no part in, the, in its subsequent history, except, however, in the case of, uh, you know, the supernatural creation of man. Yeah, particularly, as we mentioned earlier, um, he espoused the principle of uniformitarianism, that the present is the key to the past. According to this, the geological record should be interpreted by assuming that processes observed today had operated in similar fashion in the past. Rivers are currently seen to be eroding valleys very slowly. So valleys and canyons seen today must have been eroded uh, very slowly over millions of years. Right. And if uh, sediments are currently deposited in lakes and the oceans very slowly, again, sedimentary rocks seen today must have been built up slowly over millions of years. Similarly, volcanic activity is understood to be acting gradually, continuously raising or lowering land masses and continents over eons of time. Yeah. All this was in sharp contrast to the thinking of most of Lyle's contemporaries, who saw in the rocks either a series of violent catastrophes, uh, floods and cataclysmic vol uh, volcanic activity, or the aftermath of the Genesis Flood. Right, according to Lyle, the, uh, the rocks tell the story of the continual birth and extinction of species. That's where he was going. <laughs> Thus, plants and animals would have been created or would have arisen by uh, some kind of natural process uh, with a form specially adapted to suit a particular environment. Then over the, the millennia, as the environment changed, these would have be become extinct, only to be replaced with new species as the old forms died out. Uh, somehow new ones were born. Uh, although Lyle didn't, uh, at that stage, believe in progressive evolutionary process as, as Darwin was later to conceive, he did argue for the rocks providing the history of life over millions of years. Right, and this influence of Lyle's thinking on, on Charles Darwin Darwin, um, you know, can't be overestimated. Yes. Referring to, the, to, yeah. to his voyage on the Beagle, he wrote this, I had brought with me the first volume of Lyle's Principles of Geology, which I studied attentively, and this book was of the highest service to me in many ways. The very first place which I examined, namely St. Jago in the uh, Cape Verde Islands, showed me clearly the wonderful superiority of Lyle's manner of treating geology compared with that of any other author whose works I had uh, with me or afterwards read. Yeah, and speaking of the time he lived in London, after the Beagle voyage, he commented, uh, he said this, I saw more of Lyle in any other 
than any other man, both before and after my marriage. His mind was characterized, as it appeared to me, by clearness, caution, sound judgment, and a good deal of originality. In later life, uh, Darwin wrote, the science of geology is enormously indebted to Lyle, more so, as I believe, than to any other man who ever lived. And it wasn't just Darwin that influenced, uh, that, that he influenced. Lyell was a powerhouse as far as influencing an entire generation of, of scientists. Uh, and we'll look more at the life and motivations, at his life and motivations, when we get back. In 1994, the prestigious journal Science shocked the scientific world by publishing sequence data from DNA retrieved from dinosaur bone said to be 80 million years old. DNA is a fragile molecule and so it breaks down quickly. Measurements of DNA stability suggest it could last thousands of years at best under the likely conditions. But 80 million years was just too incredible for other skeptical scientists. Eventually these skeptics were vindicated as it became apparent that the original researchers had sequenced contaminating human DNA, not dinosaur DNA. However, in 2012, a different group of researchers published new results supporting the discovery of actual dinosaur DNA. These new results appear much harder to disprove, with the researchers applying multiple checks against contamination from non-dinosaur sources. The preservation of dinosaur DNA doesn't make sense from an evolutionary perspective, but it fits biblical history, whereby dinosaurs lived thousands of years ago, not millions of years ago. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. If you just tuned in today, we're talking about uniformitarianism and the age of the earth. Now, 19th century geologist and lawyer Charles Lyell is renowned for popularizing the idea that the world's geology reflected an old age of the earth. That, that's, that's much older than the Bible's approximately 6,000 year time frame of history. Uh, thus paving the way and providing some traction for Charles Darwin's evolutionary ideas. Right. Uh, but was Charles Lyell truly viewing the rocks from a scientifically objective perspective? That's the question, yeah. yeah. Not, not at all. <laughs> now, now, we've covered some of what we're, uh, we're sharing here before. Uh, we've covered this on Creation Magazine Live before. Uh, but before we get into the more scientific aspects of uniformitarianism, it's important to lay the groundwork that uniformitarianism has a massive philosophical underpinning that have really little to do with you know cold hard facts so to speak it's important to understand that these ideas were not based solely on scientific findings but rather a rejection of god's word right yeah uh, in his private correspondence lyle admitted to uh, the, the strongly anti-biblical nature of his ideas he calls them anti-mosaical right. referring to the books of moses which obviously includes genesis in 1829 just a few months prior to the publication of his first volume of uh, his famous the principles of geology lyle wrote in a letter to fellow old earth geologist roderick murchison it's not a name we have often but <laughs> there you go uh, he said this, I trust I shall make my sketch of the progress of geology popular. Old Fleming, and this is referring to John, Reverend John Fleming, yeah. is frightened and thinks the age will not stand my, here it is, anti-mosaical conclusions, and at least that the subject will for a time become unpopular and awkward for the clergy. It's amazing. But I'm not afraid. I shall out with the whole, but in as conciliatory a manner as possible. Yeah, so Ooh. here we see that, <laughs> that Lyle knew full well that the, uh, the church would object to his long age views because they contradicted the Bible. Yep. Uh, but he was confident that you know, he could sway people. He, he clearly disagreed with the Mosaic count of the flood. In fact, Edward Bailey's biography of Charles Lyle records him mocking it when he writes, a few days in Paris allowed Lyle to enjoy a lecture by Prevost on diluvium and caves, a good logical refutation of the diluvian humbug. Okay, by the following year, we see that Lyle has a clear agenda to free science from Moses, and that's what he wrote on the 14th of June in 1830 in a letter to George Poulet Scope, uh, Scrope. Uh, he, he said this, I am sure you may get into the QR, that's the quarterly review, what will 
free the science from Moses, for if treated seriously, the church party, uh, the, the party of the church, will uh, are quite prepared for it. If we don't irritate, which I fear we may, though mere history, we shall carry all with us. If you don't triumph over them, but compliment the liberality and candor of the present age, the bishops and enlightened saints will join us in despising both the ancient and modern physical theologians. It is just the time to strike. So rejoi rejoice that sinner as you are, the QR is open to you. And at the end he writes, P.S., I conceived the idea about five or six years ago, that would have been 1825, 1824, something like that, that if ever the mosaic geology, there's that term again, mm -hmm. could be set down without giving offense, it would be in an historical sketch. And if you must abstract mine in order to have as little to say as possible yourself, let them feel it and point the moral. Right. I, I love that quote because what it reveals is that uh, you know, these, these ideas, uh, they're, they're, they're not, well, it reveals what they're based on, right? It it's reveals not a lot. A, yeah, not an empirical <laughs> scientific finding, but a historical sketch, a, yes. a historical narrative, an alternative history that isn't recorded by eyewitness accounts, but rather it's a made-up narrative, right? Yep. That rocks yep. are supposedly telling you. But of course, rocks don't speak for themselves. Lyle was uh, involved not in scientific investigation, but a political game. He, right. he was playing uh, you know, with, with people to ensure his uniformitarian ideas would be accepted by the church, even though he knew they clearly contradicted the plain teaching of Scripture. Yeah, Lyle's secret of scheming not only deceived the church to accept his false ideas that, that undermine the gospel, false ideas that continue to persist in the church today, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but he set geology on a wrong path for over a century. Only fairly recently have geologists recognized that, for example, as, as, as one geologist writes, Lyle also sold geology some snake oil. <laughs> he convinced geologists that all past processes acted at essentially their current rates. That is, those observed in historical time. This extreme gradualism has led to numerous unfortunate consequences, including the rejection of sudden or catastrophic events in the face of positive evidence for mm. them for no reason other than they were not gradual. And we'll, when we get back, we'll, uh, we'll talk more about those, uh, what some of those ideas are. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1 to 11, or just scroll down the page. The center column, provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. On this week's episode, we're talking about uniformitarianism and the age of the earth. Right. Now, one of the most revealing comments ever made about Charles Lyell's uniformitarianism was made by the late Marxist evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould. He was a professor of paleontology and geology at Harvard University. He said this, Charles Lyell was a lawyer by profession, and his book is one of the most brilliant briefs published by an advocate. Lyell relied upon two bits of cunning to establish his uniformitarian views as the only true geology. First, he set up a straw man to demolish. In fact, the catastrophists were much more empirically minded than Lyell. The geological record does, does seem to require catastrophes. Rocks are fractured and contorted. Whole faunas are wiped out. To circumvent this literal appearance, Lyell imposed his imagination upon the evidence. The geologic record, he argued, is extremely imperfect, and we must interpolate it into what uh, we can reasonably infer but cannot see. The catastrophists were the hard-nosed empiricists of their day, not the blinded theological apologists. All right, yeah. so, so what is this literal appearance that Gould was talking about right. here? Well, it seems obvious that most things in the fossil record were buried rapidly and catastrophically, not slowly at deposition rates observed today. Some uh, simple examples of this would be polystrate fossils, for example. Fossils that pass through several layers of rock point to the fact that the entire organism must have been buried so quickly that the organism didn't rot right. uh, before fossilizing. Uh, here are some pictures of a tree, uh, of, of tree-like plants, for example, some over 20 feet tall, standing upright through sediment, 
Obviously, that pile of sediment moved into place very quickly, and the size of the catastrophe that produced all that sediment must have been fairly large, very 20-foot tall structure there, a plant. And you can find more about that at creation.com slash polystrate. Go there and you can see more examples of that. Yeah. And mass fossil uh, graveyards yes. and bone beds. Yep. Uh, around the world, we find billions of fossils that were laid down in waterborne sediment. And many of these fossils were buried together at the same time in, in massive jumbled graves. Lots of fossils are of uh, creatures that would not have lived in the same environment together. And, and so it's evidence that they were washed into place, uh, you know, at the, at the same time by a catastrophic flood-like uh, condition. Yeah. Uh, and for details about that, you can see creation.com slash fascinating. Yeah, how about soft-bodied creatures being preserved? Creatures like jellyfish and squid have been preserved as fossils. They don't have any bones. So in order for the flesh to be preserved the way it is, they must have been buried very rapidly in sediment that turned to stone quickly to preserve them before they rotted away. And for more details on that, you go to creation.com slash jellyfish fossil. It's amazing. These things are fossilized. Yeah. Also, canyons formed in days. Right. right? Uh, take uh, Burlingame uh, Canyon near Walla Walla, Washington. It's a small-scale analogy to Grand Canyon. Uh, and this, this was observed to form in less than six days. Days. It me measures 450 meters, that's 1,500 feet long, up to 35 meters, 120 feet deep, and again is wide, uh, winding through the hillside. Yeah, amazing. And Canyon Lake Gorge in Texas is a gorge about, about a mile long, uh, hundreds of yards, hundreds, hundreds of meters wide, up to 50 feet uh, deep. It was carved through limestone in 2002 when the Guadalupe River flooded its banks, leading to a huge amount of water going over the spillway at the Canyon Lake Reservoir, formed that canyon yep. rapidly. <laughs> and a news article said, geologic time has a different meaning when it comes to Canyon Lake Gorge. Yeah. You could say it dates to around the end of the Enron era. <laughs> you remember Enron? Yeah, it it yeah. dates to when uh, the catastrophe uh, you know, that, that formed it happened, which was during the Enron scandal. Yeah, wow. Uh, canyons can form rapidly. Yeah. Uh, a good maximum to remember is either it takes a little water and a lot of time, or a lot of water and a little time. Mm -hmm. The problem is, we're, we've never seen canyons form slowly with just a little bit of water. Whenever scientific observations are made, it's a lot of water in a short period of time. This makes sense both in the light of observations and the Bible. Uh, gouges, gashes, canyons in the landscape don't need millions of years of erosion to form. Right. So the facts we see in geology are far easier to interpret as evidence for catastrophic processes over a short period than uniform processes over a long period. Right. And we'll look into more of this when we get back. Did you know that the DNA code is itself governed by another code known as the epigenetic code? This physical and chemical code determines which genes are switched on. Changes in this code can greatly alter an organism without altering one letter of its DNA. For instance, scientists have managed to change the coat color in mice by feeding them a diet that switches off certain genes. Epigenetics poses new problems for evolution. For instance, a group of animals with a camouflaged coat color might be favored in a particular environment. But if this coat color is due to epigenetics and not the actual DNA code, then the non-camouflaged animals would be selected against in vain. When the epigenetic modification is reset by a diet change, natural selection is sent back to square one. The field of epigenetics therefore creates problems for evolution and strongly points to a master programmer who invented the DNA and epigenetic codes. To find out more from Creation Ministry International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, our subject today is uniformitarianism and the age of the earth. Right, let's, let's focus in on a specific issue that again shows how uniformitarianism is very limited in explanatory power okay. and that the concept of a global flood uh, far better uh, fits the facts we find worldwide. And, and, and that's the topic of amber. Right? Fossil amber, cool. uh, which is tree resin, has been found all over the world, containing well-preserved insects and, and even identifiable microbes in the insect's gut. 
uh, flowers, moss, snails, lizards, bird feathers, even mammal hair has been found. Right. Among secular scientists, there has been a considerable uncertainty and disagreement as to how amber's contents came to be so entombed. Uh, most, researchers, most researchers had the view that resin uh, oozing from trees uh, solidified on the bark and organisms got stuck uh, in it and, and were then enclosed by successive outflows. Right, but one problem with that scenario is that it, it doesn't account for the abundant aquatic organisms found in amber, yeah. such as crustaceans, <laughs> water beetles, barnacles, oysters, clams, water spiders, uh, algae, uh, and bacteria. How could aquatic creatures, both freshwater and marine, have become trapped in this sticky tree sap? That's the question, yeah. Well, Alexander Schmidt from, the, Univer from uh, uh, the Museum of Natural History in Berlin, Germany, and David Dilscher from the University of Florida in the USA, believes they now have have the answer. Uh, after using a handsaw to cut bark from trees in a Florida swamp, they observed that the resulting resin flowing into the water trapped small crustaceans and water beetles and mites and aquatic bacteria and fungi and other things. Uh, their research shows that aquatic insects can be trapped in resin in water. So the presence of aquatic organisms in amber is the result of a simple natural process, sort of. <laughs> well, cutting cutting bark with a handsaw in a swamp it's hardly well, hardly a, a, a natural everyday process but but the results of the re researchers in, in, ingenious uh, field study is great news for creationists when yes. you think about it yes. many of whom have long predicted that amber fossils worldwide are the the legacy of the Genesis flood yeah now although Schmidt and Dilcher are staunch evolutionists consider how their own observations and conclusions indicate that uh, for the abundant worldwide amber Amber fossils to have formed conditions provided by a global catastrophic flood were needed. Mm -hmm. uh, water delays the process of solidification and, or, or amberization that in air is normally driven by oxygen. Thus, the resin stays stickier for longer underwater and is more likely to trap insects and other organisms in the water. New scientists reported that resin in water is probably more of a hazard to insects than resin actually on tree bark. Right. It's amazing. In Schmidt and Dilcher's field study, the tree resin uh, didn't solidify, but they say it might have turned uh, to solid amber if the pond water, uh, water level fell and, you know, given enough protection by layers of sediment, the amber could survive intact for millions of years. Okay. But the layers of sediment they mention need to be carried in somehow. Mm -hmm. Maybe by rushing water. <laughs> and Schmidt and Dilcher's, uh, uh, they, they suggest, their suggested scenario for amber uh, fossil formation involves a flood. In their own words, once aquatic insects, insects are trapped in the tree resin, they said this, the pond then dries out in the summer and a flood brings in sediment to cover the forest floor so the resin piece becomes well conserved, later turning into amber. Yes, hmm. and of course the, the catastrophic global uh, flood would have vastly multiplied the effect of Schmidt and Dilcher's uh, handsaw right. <laughs> scenario. For example, you'd expect uh, that uprooted trees smashing against each other in the swirling current and waves would uh, lose their bark, release copious quantities of tree resin, and uh, while still fluid, the resin would have enveloped uh, both aquatic and uh, terrestrial organisms, right. uh, displaced from their usual habitat by the, by the floodwaters. Herbert uh, Nissen, former professor of botany at uh, Lund University in Sweden and a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, described the famous Baltic amber deposits this way. He said, the insects are modern types and their geographical distribution can be ascertained. It is then quite astounding to find that they belong to all regions of the earth, not only to the paleoarctic region as was to be expected, the geological and paleobiological facts concerning the layers of amber are impossible to understand unless the explanation is accepted that they are the result of an alongthenous process, including the whole earth. Right. So again, the creationist explanation makes more sense. It does. And we'll be back in a minute. Creation Ministries International edifies the body of Christ by providing more than 30 years of Bible-supporting scientific research, delivered through speaking engagements, books, magazines, and a variety of media, much of which is archived on our website, creation.com. 
Did you know that if you read three articles on creation.com each day, it would take over seven years to read them all? Such a wealth of information didn't arise by chance, however. We do this through the faithful prayers and gifts of our supporters, which also fund ongoing research. Support the building up of the church by partnering with CMI. Donate today at creation.com slash donate. Okay, welcome back. As we wrap things up here, we're going to look at a feedback. We often get emails into the website, and uh, and this one here we've 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 titled "Estrogen in Men?" Question mark. <laughs> so here we go. This yeah. is a letter that uh, that came in from Christopher from the United States. My dad recently engaged my aunt in a discussion on homosexuality. My aunt said that because men have X and Y chromosome, they are torn in their sexuality, <laughs> and also because men have estrogen. Now, I gave many examples as to why this is wrong. However, I wanted a more informed position. And then, then he says, I'm extremely sorry to have bothered CMI. <laughs> I appreciate your work. Is there anything I can do to help CMI? Please let me know. God bless and keep your eyes on Jesus. All right. There we go. So one of our uh, fellows, Sean Doyle, responded this way. Uh, regarding your aunt's uh, men having X and Y chromosomes makes them sexually confused argument. There are a number of problems with it. Uh, first, if having an X and Y chromosome made one confused about one's sexuality, why wouldn't all men be sexually confused? Regardless of the definition used, only a very small percentage of men would be confused about their homosexuality. As such, your aunt's statement is empirically false. Second, what about biologically ordinary women who have two X chromosomes? There are lesbians, biological women pretending to be men, and women who, uh, whose self-described sexual identity changes over time. And there would be no doubt be women who would be unsure about their sexual identity. Are, right. are any of these women less confused than men? Right, and then, then he says, finally, just because men have an X chromosome does not make them half women. Uh, according to many other important, among many other important things, it means they can procreate and produce female offspring. Yeah. That's kind of handy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the X chromosome houses a number of genes essential to human survival, and since men are humans, men need the X chromosome. Right, so, and, and, and on uh, her other point, do men produce estrogen? Uh, yes, but it's not because men started off as women. Uh, men have, after all, had the male XY sex chromosome condition uh, since fertilization. Rather, estrogen is an important hormone for men to have, and it's even uh, important for male reproductive function. The idea that estrogen is a female hormone was refuted 20 years ago. And furthermore, females produce the male sex hormone testosterone. So if estrogen in males right. causes them to be confused about their sexuality, why does not testosterone in females do the same? These notions are devoid of scientific merit. Okay, so there's a number of, I mean, our, our focus as a ministry is creation, evolution, the book of Genesis, and, right. and the truth and accuracy of the Bible. And then, then we get uh, interesting subjects like this to right. tackle as well. And uh, so, yeah, well, that's, you know, God created mankind, male and female, in the beginning, Adam sure. and Eve. Yep. And, and so, but when people are trying to deny the truth of God's word and, and, and the Bible and, of course, promote evolution, you're going to get arguments like this come yeah, up to try yeah. to just break down that, that basic concept. There's an attempt at a justification for homosexual behavior and so on. That, which God uh, well, condemns a, in his word. Which God condemns in his word very clearly. A lot of, a lot of Christian organizations uh, uh, say that, oh, well, no, that it, it doesn't say that. The Bible clearly says that. That's right. And, and there are many other behaviors that are wrong as well. Often homosexuality gets, gets kind of the big black right. label. Adultery is wrong as well. Yeah, also it's gluttony. <laughs> so it's, it's, so it's, that's just, there's a lot yeah. of stuff that we should avoid in order to please God with how we live. Yeah. Anyways, next week on Creation Magazine Live, Handling the Critics. We'll see you next week and we'll talk about handling critics. That'll be interesting.